Thank you for joining us on the podcast, uh, this very special podcast that we have going on today. We are the Relennials. I'm Pat. I'm Ruby. And we have a very special guest joining us today. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hey guys, my name is Addison Morgan. I am a police officer of almost 10 years now. Dang, has it been that many years? I know, the seasoned veteran now. Oh, you are a veteran, that's crazy. Holy cow. Makes me feel old, guys. I remember running around in high school with y'all. Come on. I know. Isn't that insane? <laughs> what? What happened to the time? Yeah, we've we've grown up a little bit. That's for sure. Yeah, we're we're just out here pretending to be adults. <laughs> that's how I feel. <laughs> I'm sure Addison sees things differently as an <laughs> authority figure. I know. He's like, whoa. <laughs> oh, well, that's man. what I'm doing. <laughs> But uh, I've been excited about this, actually. We've uh, exchanged some articles and some resources and things that um, are topical. We had this scheduled, actually, before any of that stuff happened last week in Virginia. Uh, That was crazy. What do you think about that? It's so weird how society decides that, you know, we're... We're going to riot, and that's our first decision. We're not going to try and work through a problem. We're just going to take to the streets and and riot and just cause utter chaos. And I've I've never understood that from you know from Ferguson to every other riot that we've had since then. I, I've never understood what the the purpose of it is and what what is what it's actually proving in the end yeah it's hard to see it's 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 definitely hard to see when it's happening there are i I feel like historically there are some things that peaceful you know specifically peaceful protests have changed like you know martin luther king jr and stuff like that which he advocated for peaceful protesting of course non-violence but it's hard to like I don't I don't think or maybe they did I don't know obviously we weren't there but I don't think that even people there knew really what was happening as it was happening like I feel like it was in retrospect and when people were wow that really like changed things you know what I mean but I'm not I'm not saying that like yeah especially what happened in Virginia that was just crazy a lot I feel like a lot of what's happening today people don't really know what they're like even fighting for half of the people are just rioting just to riot I feel like well and they're just doing it I do feel like it's it's like a time thing like they're like oh everybody's going out to riot right now so I gotta go but without really putting that much thought into it they just take action which in some cases just taking action is the right thing to do but at the same time people sh- you know people sh- people should know why they're out there people should know what they're out there doing and people should have a plan and i just feel like a lot of times uh, a lot of the people that are out there don't i agree and i think i think what gets me the most is that i'm all for peaceful protest i mean that's your right you have a constitutional right to be able to do that but what I don't understand is why every time it resorts to looting and property damage and violence and assaults and murders and and what I don't understand is what what does that prove? I mean, you, you give the example of Martin Luther King and look what he helped do by doing peaceful protest. I mean, look at look at the world that those people lived in and he still went out and protested peacefully when 
you saw all of the you know the racial inequality and all of the the blatant racism that was going on and he still advocated for peace and ruby i think you're right you know people don't know what they're protesting for it's like they come out of their house and someone hands them a sign with a swastika on the front and say hey go join these guys and and uh, make a difference well i also feel like it's that crowd mentality and and that does that's not just for this that i mean that's for everything like that has to do with you know marketing is a crowd mentality um just anything and just anything that can influence a crowd people will just jump on it I don't know if I'm explaining myself correctly. Yeah, no, I think th- what I was going to say is that I that, but um, th- it, people devolve right into when those, in those situations they become very hasty and very uh, they devolve into these animalistic tendencies, which I don't. I've I've never been to a protest like that, so I couldn't say for sure. But I feel like when they people when they go out there, they're not necessarily anticipating rioting when you know when they leave their house they get there and then people get all riled up and it's like going to like a rock concert or something you know and like they're like holy shit this is crazy this is badass like and they jump in the mosh pit yeah and then they get all hype and then basically lose themselves and start getting all crazy into and then fall into that crowd mentality i'm not saying it's right or wrong or anything like that i'm just saying like that is like the devolution if you will of like the human psyche in that environment Mm -hmm. Uh, people get really passionate I did want to ask your opinion about because the police specifically have been receiving a lot of criticism uh, in that specific scenario in Virginia about they didn't you know they didn't do the right thing they had not uh, they weren't prepared for that or they allowed it to happen what do you think about people commenting that way I think you're always going to have that argument. Uh, no one is ever going to be 100% satisfied with how things are done or how things are handled. You see so many people that will Monday morning quarterback these situations when they themselves have never been faced with that type of incident. Mm-hmm. And while you know we can train for that, hours upon hours upon hours but the dynamic of each of these riot type scenarios is much different than the than the others so you know i can i can sit here and train for a ferguson but then you're going to have different qualities in a charlottesville and and i mean of course no one is going to be 100 percent happy with what's done People are going to see through media outlets that these quote unquote peaceful protesters are now being hit with tear gas, now being, you know, pulled to the ground by police and arrested and and everything like that. And so you it's a it's a hard road for us as law enforcement to try and pave because of course you see the negative but you don't see a lot of the positive. I mean, and I, and I go back to Ferguson a lot because one of the images that I see or that I remember from Ferguson are, is an image of this, this young boy who comes up to this police officer and sits there and hugs him at length as he's crying because he's so happy that, you know, the riots are coming to an end and that there's some peace in his city again. And I mean, so much of that is drowned out by the negativity that just, in my opinion, fuels more of these riot situations. I agree. I think that is 100% true. I think that um, a lot of how people perceive what is happening is false. It's been uh, provided to them through the lens of the media, Mm -hmm. which has an agenda to sensationalize everything. Uh, for better or worse, genuinely, generally for worse, as it turns out, um, that's the nature of the media. The I think the problem, in my opinion, is that it most of it is the media, and that the they the nature of media and reporting is you know very heavily geared towards negativity, 
and criticism uh wherever they you know wherever they can find fault they rarely ever get and whether that's you know the media providing a mirror for society because that's what we want to see as society or whether that you know I, it's you know what came first the chicken or the egg argument but it's still it it's annoying for me because people don't seem to understand that that is generally why they have these emotions about how what's going on is because of how they perceive it through the media and not how it is actually in reality. Well, and because a lot of people have these opinions based off of what they're seeing on TV, social media, whatever. But it's true. They're, they may not be there experiencing it because I haven't been to a protest like that either. And I don't know how I would react and I'm upfront about that. I'm not saying I'd, I'd get there and act a certain way. I could say I'm going to act a certain way, but I may not. And that's just human nature. And I think that people forget, yes, police officers are trained for these situations, but they are also, they are also going to act based off of the situation as it presents in itself. And that is going to be affected by the people that are there protesting you know and you don't know what you're gonna get at an event like this because it's a it's a group it's a group of different people so you know half the people might be there to peacefully protest but there may be a few insidious people that are gonna be there to cause harm and uh, you know as as law enforcement your job is to protect you know the majority right and so you you have choices to make um so you know i i just feel like people might not see both sides of that um but you know you can't you it's it's all in retrospect basically you can only look back and say okay it could have been handled better but you know when you're in the midst of it it's really really hard well that brings up an important question that i have is how much, I mean, it's only uh, up until Ferguson, wouldn't, would you say, I'm making an assumption here, uh, but would you say that most of your training was geared towards dealing with maybe like individuals or small groups of people? I mean, is there, is there a shift in police training that's forcing police to have to start, you know, training uh, intensively on these type of you know, huge groups, huge rioting type style training? So when I went through training, Ferguson had not happened. So we went through a basic riot scenario type training. And I didn't notice a major shift once Ferguson happened. I think we just kind of try and look at it from what we see through television, what we see through their tactics that we see as law enforcement and just kind of build off of what they were doing and, you know, what we think we could have done differently and how we would do it in our city. Um, But I didn't, I didn't notice any type of shift in saying, okay, now that Ferguson happened, we need to spend an additional month trying to figure out riot scenarios and things like that you know when we when we're trained we're trained for essentially everything Mm -hmm. and it's on us through experience once we we receive that basic training to build on how we're going to handle situations and so that's where you see a lot of discrepancy sometimes in how officer a Um, deals with a situation and as opposed to officer B because you look at at so many differences does officer A have 10 years on compared to officer B who has one you know does officer A have extensive training in deconfliction and verbal judo and officer B likes to just yell and scream and wants everybody to hear him. So, and of course, you know, looking on the outside in, you can't, you can't know who you're going to deal with. Just like we don't know who we're going to deal with. Right. And so, I mean, that's kind of going beyond your question, but 
um, I, to kind of circle back to that question, no, we're not receiving additional training for those scenarios, but we are trained more through experience in dealing with people and dealing with situations where you're going to interact with those who have the qualities that you'll see at a, a riot or a major incident. Well, and what you're saying for the difference between Officer A and Officer B, I mean, that extrapolates to even, like, one city to the next. I mean, I can't I imagine the culture where you're at is the same as it is there in Virginia in terms of the culture of their police department, their city officers, and things like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and, of course, I mean, like I said, you get a basic series of training that essentially every police officer gets. Now, every department, of course, has different policies, different procedures, different ways of handling things. They have the minor changes, but for the most part, everyone knows how to do the job on a basic level. I could pick up from where I'm at right now, go to Kansas City, and know the basic way to do the job there, if that makes sense. Yeah, that does make sense, for sure. Man... Yeah, that stuff's intense. I mean, I, uh, I, you know, I don't have any good answers. I think that's the. I think that's what is depressing to most people is that like no one has any good answers to like how to fix it. Mm-mm. There's just like so much. I don't know if it's hate or like if it's just if it's hate or if it's just genuine disagreement and like it turn people who are hateful are the ones who are being exposed. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's a lack of, as a society, is how to cope with, with these intense issues that are happening it, it, just in general in our country. So people have to find a way to cope with it. So they're either, you know, it's a, it's a fight or flight response. So if you think about it, you're going to go fight, which would probably be like protest, or you're going to, just like shy away from the situation, not do anything. And so the people that are out there, I, I feel like they're in a, they're in a, they're in a fight response, you know? So that's already probably not good because people are just going out. Maybe I don't think not necessarily on a whim, but without really, really thinking about what it is they're actually doing and maybe what it could escalate to. I think they go out there with the best of intentions, maybe. Yeah. Or the worst of intentions. I don't know. Uh, but they don't, you know, they nobody knows where it could lead to. Right. What are your, what's your thoughts on them taking down all the uh, Confederacy statues and whatnot? In my opinion, I, I think we are a society that is very much a knee-jerk reaction type society and for there to be no issues with these statues for years and years and years and now all of a sudden we have one incident and now we're going to burn the city I, I, I don't understand it again it goes back to you know what what is the purpose of destroying your city um just like when you have people who will go out and loot stores, I mean, you're, you're depriving your own community of, of its resources and you're putting business owners out of tons of money. And I mean, what is this proving in the end? How is this furthering any type of resolution between anything? All it is, is just, it's just vandalism and just taking down, you know, historical monuments for what, yeah, I mean, I I think that there, it's valid to take away the monuments. Um, I think that they represent something that we don't want to glorify in our country. I think it's fair for governors and mayors and whomever to decide to take it down legitimately and have them removed. Uh, now these have this has been going on there. I want to say in North Carolina or someplace where they had been removing statues slowly over. A period of time since way before maybe over the last year since Virginia um 
I think it's not fair to say that like it hasn't like that up until this point it hasn't caused problems because I mean neither of us have lived there in the south and we are neither of us are black or African American. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I have heard stories uh, of people who have lived in those cities and in those communities and they have to go to those government buildings to just do their normal daily business and are forced to confront those like Confederate monuments uh, that are essentially celebrating the, the his, their historical slavery and entrapment. Um, and so I... On that side, I definitely understand why it's fair for them to want those things gone. I mean, they do pay those, they they work and they pay taxes in their community. I think it is unfair for them to have to look at those statues when they go and, you know, register their vehicle or whatever it is that they need to do at those government buildings. Um, and so I see, I definitely see the valid point on that side. And I don't understand the point of the other side necessarily where they are creating all this uh, now i'm saying there's violence on both sides of course but i don't understand the the need to fight so vehemently on the, their side to protect it i mean of course they have a right to free speech and be as hateful and or racist as they want to be but it just i just to me it seems like they have a not only invalid but also just illogical irrational view of history celebrating like nazi culture and all those things i'm not saying everyone uh even in those protests you know viewed the viewed themselves as demonstrating that type of behavior but i think a, a lot of those people did specifically in virginia i'm not saying that everybody who wants to keep the statues feels the same exact way but the people who claim that they're not racist and claim that they're not hateful and uh i feel have an ignorant or naive view of history that they're trying to represent that's also just incorrect uh that's kind of my thoughts about it but obviously like i don't advocate any type of violence or rioting or any degradation of the community just for like to fight on either side what's the right way about about how do people go about this though that's i mean I, i'm kind of with addison on this like I don't get it either. I see people being desperate. People get desperate and want to get violent. But I still, like, how... I'm all about the solutions, people. <laughs> like, I know right. we, like, talk about problems, but I'm all about the solutions. But how do we... What Addison, in your opinion, what's what's a better way of, of, of making change? Like, we, me and Pat, you know, just personally, and sometimes on the podcast we talk about, you know, ways of ways that things could be better or better systems or just like more efficient ways of doing things. But just from your perspective, like what's a way that you could, that, that people, and, and I guess maybe I'm speaking like millennial millennials in general, like that they could bring about change regardless of issue. Right. Because we've been seeing a lot of diff different types of issues. Sure. So I think Pat made a good point in the fact that, a lot of these people are not educated as to what these statues rep represent. Mm -hmm. And they have relied on social media and what people have commented or put on, on social media. And so they take that as gospel rather than going and trying to fact check things and to see if, you know, what these people are saying is valid or if it's just a bunch of rhetoric that they're trying to spew to people to say, look, this statute is, the statue is wrong because of this, you know, when in reality it, it, it could be um, such a thing that it's not, that it is something that is, that is good for the community, that is good for that state and it represents something positive. But Pat's right. I mean, that's, that's a good way to look at it. If you're someone who can look at that statue and say, yeah, this is a statue glorifying slavery, glorifying years and years of the the pain and suffering that had to go on. And here you are putting this in my face every time I'm coming in to do regular business. Yeah, it's, it's a slap in the face. Uh, let me, it would be as if I was walking in that same position and there was a picture of a dead policeman as a statue. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, of course I'm going to be, I'm going to be disrespected, angry, but the difference in that is that I'm not going to immediately go and find 10 of my friends and we're going to come by in the middle of the night and knock the statue over. I mean, I think, I think people are just so quick to want to just cause damage or, or try and resolve the issue when in reality it just makes it worse. I also I think, think that there's just a lot of trolls. I think there's a lot of people that see this as a really hot button issue and probably like a bunch of 17 year old, 18 year old punks mm -hmm. going out there and it's probably, it could be a group of friends, like multi, multi ethnic group of friends that are skateboarders, white, black Asian. friends, Asians, <laughs> and they go and just knock over these statues so that like, cause they know that the news will pick it up and it'll cause like a race riot and you know, like, I think that there's a lot of trolls out there, and I think that uh, the people who are legitimately causing vandalism, whether it be for troll trolling purposes or for legitimate political statements, or I, I won't use the word legitimate, but for political statements, uh, I think it's a very, very small percentage of the people. And uh, again, I point at the media for sensationalizing that very tiny percentage and misrepresenting it and making it seem like it's bigger than it is. Yep. And I mean, just to kind of go back on Ruby's question, uh, what is the solution? I don't know. Uh, do you, do you go as a, as a town and petition to have the statue removed or do you try and go out and see if you can build something else that represents the other side of the issue? And so that you can, I guess, make everyone happy. You'll never please everybody. But at the same time, you have to look for those solutions instead of just immediately going to the far end of the spectrum and trying to make the situation worse. Me personally, I'm not a huge monuments person at all. I'd rather them spend $50,000 in schools or something than put up a... A piece of stone that's going to sit there for a hundred years. Agreed. Did you hear about this? So there's a monument. Oh man, my coworker was telling me about it. There's a monument that they spent like stupid money, maybe like millions of dollars, and then somebody misspelled Shakespeare on it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like why? Where is this at? I don't know. Let me text her and find out. Oh man. I didn't get all the deeds on that. But, but you know what, what, guys? That just goes back to one of our core values here at the Millennials, and it's stay woke. Just like w when you're hearing something, instead of just taking it at face value, look into the issue. Look at it from all sides. And I know me and Pat have both been advocates of that. We've both been like, okay, just actually how we live and how we just look at issues. We do like to look at both sides. We like to dive in. And we like to make sure that we are constantly saying that, you know, we we're, we could change our mind about it if we find out new information. So yeah. I just like to encourage all the listeners out here to keep that in mind. You know, look into the issues actually, and also know how you feel about the issues. People are probably looking into things without even knowing how to feel about them. And then they're taking action without even just knowing what emotions are really you know, they're really going through. So I don't know. It's just, it, it's just, it just goes to show that there's way more to think about. It's not black and white. There's definitely a gray area and there's definitely more than one side. And we should all look at both sides, make sure you consider that there is a gray area and that everything is not just a black and white issue. So what do you think right now about the like current state of law enforcement? Do you feel like I feel like it hasn't been as much at, in the news as it has been over the last couple of years? Like maybe I don't know if it's like Donald Trump that has been more or like the whole, is it like race that has kind of like taken the heat off the cops or do you feel like that it's still the same? Like do you feel like uh as a police officer that it's still like a uh, high pressure since uh since like ferguson and stuff like that so 
I noticed a, a big difference after Ferguson happened, and it it really changed the way that we started doing things. It almost felt like we were trying to be a little more hands off, a little more almost worried about engaging some people in certain situations. And, and, and that's kind of a scary thought because it's forced a lot of newer officers to be almost scared to engage in situations where you absolutely need to. And so, and this, this happens historically with law enforcement. When you have a major incident where the police are viewed on a very negative level, the pendulum always swings and pretty soon you'll see that law enforcement is again a high priority and people are glad that they're around and everything like that but it's kind of it's kind of swinging back and forth in the middle right now i feel like it's gotten a lot better but at the same time i think and i was actually talking to some of my former co-workers and and also just listening to that Joe Rogan podcast with Michael Wood, that we are very reactive, that gone are the days where we were, we were a proactive police department or any law enforcement in general, where we would actually take the time to go into neighborhoods to try and talk with people to see what their issues were and to try and solve them that way. And, and I think if, if for those that who, who haven't listened to the Joe Rogan podcast on the two with Michael Wood is that, I mean, he brings up some excellent, excellent points. I mean, he actually, he's the reason that I, I reached out to you guys to want to do this because he's right on so many accounts. And, and it's unfortunate because, you know, there are many factors as to why we're not the, the, problem solvers anymore and and it comes down to so many things i mean it comes down to the amount of employees that we have the amount of people that even want to sign up to be police officers given the the things that they see now on tv you have so many people who don't want any part of that so it it keeps them away from wanting to even apply for a police department because they don't want to have to deal with that But you also look at, you know, training. And I mean, like I said before, we get a basic series of training and then you're expected to go out and perform. I mean, it's, it's, it's basically a performance. I mean, we're, we're there to do our job and you give us the basic knowledge and it's our job to learn more and to get better. So Again, I mean, I, I kind of go off on a tangent, but um, to answer your question, I think it's more difficult in a policy sense, but I don't feel like my job title has changed, and I don't feel like the way that I interact with people has changed from pre-Ferguson. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I think Michael Woods had a very very insightful as you were just saying very insightful uh, perspective on it I, I like a lot of his ideas very uh specifically the ideas about like how how maybe how to approach uh like community policing uh like proactively and i know you're saying that like it seems like there's a dichotomy there because of how people are reacting to police in the country since ferguson it's like made it harder to even try to do that um i remember like do you guys do this as in in your city or your department where like uh you i remember when we were kids right when like the cops would come and like hang out at school we'd have like assemblies with cops and like fire department and stuff like that do you guys do that with kids anymore um i don't think it's as prevalent in my jurisdiction just because we're a larger city and the opportunities for that to happen are are fewer than in the small municipal municipality that I worked in but 
I mean, we still have resources in, in every school. I mean, we do have school resource officers who are there at school all day who are there for those kids to serve as a positive influence and to know that they can they can help them if they need it. Um, but but going back to community policing, like I, I am a very strong advocate for that because I've I've met so many people going into these, you know, for lack of a better term, lower income neighborhoods and actually talking to them like human beings. And you, you hear this during the Michael Wood podcast is that, you know, he, he knows that we're so reactive and that we're not taking the time to actually talk to people that, you know, we're, they're expecting us as the police to every time we drive by to just hassle them, to get out of our car and be like, Hey, what are you guys doing? Hey, what, what's going on over here? Even if they're doing absolutely nothing wrong. So that, that leaves an impression in their mind that every time they see the police, they're going to be, they, they just expect to be hassled. And that's, and that's not how it should be at all. And that's the unfortunate part is that so many situations like that have occurred and so it's so hard to change their mindset or to at least make them feel better about talking to the police for those of us that do still try and actually have a conversation and treat them like a human being. Yeah, I, I, I think it's really unfortunate that the majority, overwhelming majority of police officers are really good people and are genuinely trying to help people out. Um, even if, you know, even if their perspective is being a hard ass and like getting criminals off of the street, they're still genuinely trying to help like the greater population. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's a little bit unfortunate or really unfortunate. I should say that, uh, all of the good cops out there have to face that, that kind of mentality. Do you think that they're, and I'm trying to recall because I haven't re-listened to the Michael Woods thing in a really long time. He may have addressed this, but like, do you personally think that there is anything that can be changed in terms of how police are trained? Um, I know I sent you like an article about how there's like different training in Europe and things like that that produce different results. Obviously, it's a different culture. Mm -hmm. um, but do you personally think there is anything? Um, about like the process maybe that you went through or the new police officers go through that would effectively change or inc make it better i know one like one i can't remember if i've told you this or not or if i brought it up to somebody else but i personally would like to see in police training a, a lot more heavier uh sociology aspect of it where you're learning about like different um you know, ethnic cultures where you're learning about uh, uh, characteristics of poverty. And I know these are things that you're seeing on the job as you go, but I think uh, just having like way more in depth, like sociology courses and even like psychology courses where you're learning to recognize that you're dealing with someone that has maybe mental disabilities or mental mm -hmm. in uh mentally incapable of reason or something like that now obviously i'm not saying like they train doctors or phys, uh, psych, psych doctors or anything to that extreme but um i feel like maybe more training and i'm not even trying to say that i know what your training was or is um but like training of that nature i think could be helpful in lots and lots of situations lots of different situations sure so just to give you kind of a a quick breakdown of what our training looks like. So you go through an academy. Uh, that's where you're trained your basic skills, you know, your firearms, defensive tactics, um, driving. You learn the laws of your city, of your state, and, and everything like that, and you're tested academically in all of those skills. One of the good things that we got to go through is that towards the conclusion of our academy, we actually had different members of different cultures come into our academy class and actually sit down and talk to us one-on-one -on -one about their specific culture and, you know, how they've interacted in the past with police and what we can do if we do interact with their community. So that certainly helps 
it helped me because for some I I'd, I'd never interacted with with those type of cultures so it was good to learn that information now once you graduate the academy then you go out in the street and you're trained by a training officer so my personal opinion is that is the time that you really need to learn your skills in being able to talk to people because talking to people in a in a environment that is controlled in the academy setting is much different than talking to actual human beings on the street so when you you have the opportunity to stop in and talk to business owners or talk to people in the neighborhood that's your chance to start making the connection with people even if you say hey i'm so and so i'm working you're part of town. You're going to see me a lot. I just wanted to introduce myself and just wanted to let you know if you need anything, give me a call. And it's simple as that. I mean, people just want to know that they have someone there as a resource. And and it's, it's pretty simple. It's just like talking to a stranger on the street. We talk to strangers every day. And I think that we, we have gotten so far removed from doing that and – all we want to do is just go call to call to call, you know, handle the call and move on to the next one. And a lot of people forget that people are calling the police for a reason. I mean, what happened to them, whether we think it's a big deal or not, is a major issue to them. Mm-hmm. If their house was broken into and they had things stolen that were prized possessions for them, that's a big deal. And it's bad if we go in there and just say hey what happened what was stolen okay here's your paperwork have a good day i mean that that leaves a lasting impression i mean they're already having a bad day and then we don't make it any better by coming in and just doing the bare minimum and walking away because that you know and that could be because we're having a bad day ourselves but i always look at it that if i finish a call and something bad happened and I am upset about it, I cannot let that happen and let that affect my next call. Yeah, I feel like hugs should be mandatory. (laughs) Yeah, everything should start with a hug. (laughs) And end with one. (laughs) If my house was robbed, I'd be so sad. Because I do feel like that's one of those situations where there's like, you're probably not going to get your stuff back. Unless there's like... Uh, unless like five houses got on your block got robbed and like there's security and the, the person eventually gets busted, but even like how often do they actually get the stuff back? I mean, they probably sold them somewhere or, or something like that. But like, I think a hug might make it a little bit better. I'd take a hug. Yeah, and, and I don't usually ask. That's not part of my initial uh, speech when I come in, but. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I think you can you can gauge if someone's a hugger or not. Um, if I can somehow get some training in that, then uh, I'll uh, I'll report back and see if it, yeah. if it was effective or not. I'm gonna drop that in the police training suggestion box. <laughs> right. <laughs> hug training. <laughs> Moving forward. <laughs> I like, think. Does this person get a bear hug or a, like a you know church hug or what? <laughs> what kind of hug do you give? Them? Yeah, you get yeah. the side hug, more of a side hug yeah, type like, of. Right. Like friend hug. People just or... want to. But people just want to feel at peace. They just want to feel like, you know, you came and did your job and you helped them out. They feel a little bit better about a really crappy situation. And so many times we forget about that. And we're just so mission driven, for lack of a better term, to get this call done so that we can go to the next one. Mm -hmm. And so I think if you take that extra 20 minutes to sit down and and learn about you know the things that were gone. If it was a, a really expensive watch that was passed down through generations, I mean that's that's important stuff for them to be able to tell you, just so that they feel a little bit better about the fact that you actually care a little bit. So that brings up also another interesting thing that I I've been thinking about more recently is like. I mean, this is kind of hypothetical. Um, what do you think about, like, what if police departments were broken up into divisions? Like, 
what if there was just a traffic division and like what if there was just a division that handled like burglaries and things like that so that like i mean i'm sure you like your job a lot i'm sure you like the diversity in your job but like you know what if you were what if maybe removing yourself from the situation and look at it objectively like what if there were people that were more specialized to deal with like the rioting and the highly aggressive situations and then the people who are and then those people who are highly trained for those like high stress situations aren't the ones that are having to go and like hug people when their house gets broken into right and where i'm at we're a big enough city to where we have those available to us we do have those specialized units aside from just patrol and but at the same time what that is is essentially patrol is your first line of defense and response so patrol is going to go take that burglary call and whether that call then gets sent to a detective who specializes in burglaries that patrol officer is still going to be the first one that the person interacts with that the person will see before anyone else and i mean that's the same with traffic you have people who want to go out and write tickets or want to go out and work accidents i mean you have people who who enjoy that so much that they will specialize in it and it's important once someone finds that niche that you see how positive they are with being in that specific unit because we all know that if if we do a job we don't like look at how well we perform as opposed to if we're in the the best job that we've ever had right so i mean you just you look at it in a sense that patrol sees everything and then you just start to kind of narrow your focus to what you want to specialize in so i mean those are those are certainly there and that's just not big cities i mean i know smaller departments have that option available to them too so but it helps because if you just have x amount of cops doing everything then you're i think you're more susceptible to a lot of burnout which causes a lot of people to lose focus in what they're doing and lose interest in what they're doing so you start seeing people who are doing half ass work and not really providing the citizens with the service that they deserve. Where do you see yourself in the next five or 10 years? Are you on the detective track? Um, I don't know. I I think that I'm in a position now where I am more traffic focused, but I'm getting ready to go back to, regular patrol and I'm going back there so that I can start training new recruits more Uh, because I think that's really important to have a good training officer to have them squared away when they're ready to be out on their own so I think that's that's an important step right now in the process do I want to be a sergeant at some point probably but I mean, those things are are foundations that you have to build in order to get there. Right. So, I mean, for right now, I I have I have a tentative five to ten year plan, but I mean, I have to write it in pencil because I know that it can change tomorrow, and so I just have to have to be resilient in knowing that maybe the path that I want to do now won't be the same this time next year do you watch blue bloods because i watched the shit out of that show i watched like five seasons of that straight i've never seen that so it's 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 different to watch shows when you kind of live that that mentality oh yeah for sure and so of course you just criticize it so much because you're like, well, they would never do that in real life. They would never... I mean, the thing I like about Blue Bloods is literally every episode, uh, Wahlberg's character 
<laughs> chases somebody. He never fails. He has to chase somebody. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's every hilarious. single time. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't matter, you know. And it's the same scenario over and over and over. Yeah. And so, I mean, it's comical in a sense, but it's a good show. I think they've done a, a really good job of of being close to the realization of how things are. And they've done a really good job with Tom Selleck's character to really kind of slow everything down at the end to bring out a good message from that episode. So I like it in that sense, but to watch it at length, I, I just can't, I can't get into it. <laughs> that sounds funny. like I watched the first season and then I. I thought it was yeah. funny, man. And I was out. They have a, they they, they do, do a good job of like. Uh, is that Marky Mark? Mark Wahlberg? Is that no, his brother. Oh, okay. Donnie, Don Donnie. Wahlberg. Donnie. <laughs> uh, he was a he was a new kid on the block. What? Yeah. That's Donnie. Yeah. Donnie. 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 From New Kids on the Block. Yep. Maybe I'll watch it. I'll report back to both of you. <laughs> but um, <laughs> the other thing I'm trying to figure out is what the situation is in Colorado with marijuana being legal there. Oh, good question. Mark. So. The marijuana debate is, I don't know. I, I think now that it's been legal for some time, it's kind of not as big of a deal as it was when it was first legalized. And when it was first legalized, I wasn't out there yet. So I don't, I don't know how intense it was. But I was talking again to some of my former coworkers and – it's kind of to a point now where we're really trying to grasp at straws to really push for marijuana being this terrible gateway drug and that if you smoke marijuana once, then you're guaranteed to die of a heroin overdose tomorrow. Yeah. And so it's just, and reading that article that you sent me regarding the DOJ crackdown, it's, it's such a, in my opinion, it's such a useless fight. And going back to the Michael Wood podcast, he said that they did a study over 30 years on the effects of marijuana. And he said the only thing that they came up with that was a actual detriment was gingivitis. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean... I don't know. I don't know what it is, what it's like personally. I've never, I've never partook in smoking a marijuana. Um, I know that I did uh, have Pat's bong water spilt on me once, so that's as close to the to the process as, <laughs> as, I, as I've had. So, Pat, that's a party foul. <laughs> maybe, maybe that was. That. Maybe that's what steered me away from it maybe pat's the saving grace you were if i remember you were really really pissed about that i was very upset (laughs) (laughs) oh my god i can't believe that you remember that that's hilarious but uh man that's man that's some good stuff um yeah i that whole doj that scares me man i don't like that uh Do you think that having come from a department, having been a cop for, uh, I don't know how many years, you were probably at least four or five years, I'm guessing. Yeah, it was five you, and a half. Before you moved to Colorado? Yeah. So, uh, you know, how would you say that affected, like, as a percentage of the, you know, granted it's completely different cities and things like that, but... Like, as a percentage of, like, what your department does or handles, like, drug crimes, um, do you think it allows them to focus more on the heavier drugs and the, uh, and things like that? Yeah, 100%. Um, I look at how things were at my old department and how we were very focused on marijuana and very focused on prosecution of marijuana. To fast forward now to where you see marijuana in in somebody's car, you see that someone has marijuana in their pocket and you just disregard it. It's almost like someone saying, 
yeah, I have a pack of cigarettes in my front pocket. Okay, cool, thanks. And then you move on. Because it's just, you know, we're at that point now where it's more of a hassle to actually try and deal with it because for most people, if you, if you're, if you have too much marijuana, all that you're going to get is a ticket. And what does that ultimately solve? And we confiscate the marijuana and then burn it. What does that solve? What, what have we accomplished? You know, did we, did we stop this person from ever smoking marijuana again? No. You know, and, and with all of the resources to go and buy marijuana anywhere in, in not only in the city, but in the state, it's not going to change the behavior. It's not going to make or break this person because we write them a ticket like we're writing them a speeding ticket. So, so would I you just... say that you're an advocate for legalization in other states in the sense that you know firsthand what kind of energy and resources it sucks up for your police department? I would say loosely, yes. But I think you still have to have some sort of punishment scale if we're starting to talk about, obviously, quantity of marijuana. I mean, if you're bringing in truckloads of stuff and you're trying to sell to kids at elementary schools or you know whatever the case may be then i think you still have the issue at hand but for someone who's walking down the street with a joint it makes no difference to me i i think that also for the states that are looking to legalize marijuana that they really should ensure that the money the revenue that's generated because it's a very lucrative business I mean, I don't know if you guys have looked at the numbers mm-hmm. of of sales of recreational marijuana and the amount of amount of taxation that goes into it. But if you take that revenue and put it back into schools, put it back into you know city municipalities and and, and police departments that, for anything for police for fire for EMS for the military. I mean, you have so many resources that you can give that money to but you have to do it right and the especially out in Colorado the um, marijuana enforcement division is very very good at ensuring that these dispensaries are regulated and that they're doing everything that they're supposed to be doing in order to conduct business and I think knowing that is what has allowed me to be okay with that because it's an inevitability, especially out in Colorado. You know that it's legal. You know that you know that I'm not going to walk down the street with a sign that says, you know, we should take away legalization because it's not going to do anything. It's, it's legal. We need to... Um, deal with that fact and know that nothing's going to change with that. And so knowing that that's not going to change and that you have these other officers who are keeping, you know, very strict tabs on these dispensaries uh, makes it much easier for me to, to deal with. And I actually had the privilege of going into one of these bigger dispensaries in town and they were very welcoming. They made me sign in. They made me wear an ID badge, even though I was on duty in uniform. And they actually walked me through the entire process, the entire building itself, showed me start to finish how the process works and everything. So they're aware that they're doing things right, and so they have nothing to hide. And so I start to look at it, as a regular business like if it's so how does that work so you can clock out get off the clock and go drink as much beer as you want but you can't get off your a shift and go and smoke a joint right correct how or why is that because marijuana is still illegal federally 
Oh, and as a cop, you can't violate any crime, including Correct. federal crimes. Yes. Oh. Uh. So. But, yeah, if I want to be a, a police officer who goes and drinks 12 beers and then tries to drive home, you know, but not that I do that, disclaimer, I don't do that. But, right. um, yeah, so that's why. That's the difference. Okay. Yeah, I, uh, I was recently in Colorado and bought some while I was there, and it was like the the change in it from – you know, having you know, uh, spent a number of years when I was younger growing, or not growing, excuse me. Well, I meant to say growing up, not growing weed. I was growing <laughs> up. Uh, buying weed is like, it was like such a shady, it made you feel like a very shady person. Yeah. Like you're, But then like you go into a, a well-lit, clean establishment and there's nice service people and it doesn't feel like that at all. It feels like you're just going into an Apple store. Yeah, yep. it does feel like an Apple store. Um, yeah. It's The change in it is just astonishing from when I was growing up uh, and to what it is now, especially in like Colorado and Washington and, and California and stuff. Right. Uh, still super shady here, but... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, which is an interesting dichotomy, um, it, uh, be, get, being that we're just re- next door neighbors, uh, in states, I'm interested to see how that will unfold in the future. Uh, one other thing I wanted to ask you about is like, do you guys have, uh, like what's your city? Do you have like a city policy and, or do you have to abide by state law in terms of like how you deal with illegal immigrants? So, I know what we do is we certainly do not act upon someone who is simply illegal. If we encounter somebody and they say, I'm here illegally, then we do not immediately arrest them and take them to jail for deportation. Hmm. Now, the only time that that really happens is if this person commits a serious Mm -hmm. crime and they are taken to jail and then at that point it's determined or found out that they are illegal then the jail will make arrangements with immigration services to determine if they're going to uh, put them in for deportation and I've seen it where people have been arrested who have been illegal and they've not been deported Interesting. just for the just for the sense of, I guess, you know, ice couldn't come down at a certain time or there were other issues at hand that prevented them from being able to come down in a timely manner. So a lot of these individuals are just being released. But. Um, but us alone, if I'm if I'm walking down the street and if you, Pat, are an illegal immigrant and I step out and, and you say, hey, I'm illegal, I'm not going to throw handcuffs on you, put you in the back of my car and take you to jail. So. Okay. Yeah, I'm just curious about that because that's been uh, an ongoing topic in the news. And I, I recently went to uh, an immigration hearing, a federal immigration hearing. Um, and kind of just tune into that. And I'm just realizing, well, like maybe I, I'm thinking about doing maybe a, a more journalistic piece on it, but there's so much discretion and so it's such a huge gray area for how, um, each individual case is handled throughout the country. And it's just, uh, it's interesting to, ha- to hear your perspective, like how it starts on the ground level, how they even get into the, that situation. Right. And but yeah, um, I think up. we do have to wrap it up. Hopefully, we can. Uh, I would, we would love to have you back on. Um, For sure. To talk about all kinds of other stuff. I know there's like many other things that you're interested in and talking yeah. about. Um. So, and you're obviously busy there with your family. So, uh, sorry to take away from that. Yeah, sure. Addison, thank yeah, thank you so much for being on and talking to us. And you know, it's it's just really nice to talk to somebody that came from the same place. You know, we came from, we all grew up together, we all know each other for a long time, and, 
you know, we're proud of you and we're glad that you took the time to talk to us about these issues. And we're just, you know, we're just trying to keep people informed and, you know, that's, that's just our goal. And we've, we've given our listeners a lot of good information. Thanks to you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so if, if any questions come in or anything that I can help answer, please let me know and I'll try and try and give it from my, my side of the coin and hopefully maybe that clears up some things some questions people may have about certain issues at hand but yeah let's uh let's do this again and yeah if you want to what's your do you want to talk about your social do you are you on instagram or anything yeah so instagram uh addison away a d d i s o n a w e i g h uh uh, that's pretty much the big one I use. I don't use Facebook too much anymore, and and I'm not big on Snapchat. But yeah, I'm I'm good with Instagram. Cool. I don't and, even have a Snapchat. Cool. Well, thank you again so much. We definitely will have you back on. Um, is your mom still gonna pick us up for soccer practice? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she's gonna find us uh, ditching school in the basement again too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Well, take care. It's really good to hear from you. Um, Thanks, everybody, for checking in with us. We'll post all the links in the description of all the stuff that we referenced and hopefully some more. And we are thankful that you guys tuned in. Uh, this is the Millennial signing off. Okay, bye, guys. See ya. All right, thanks, Addison. Peace. Yep.